Welcome to Financial Reporting F7. I thought I'd introduce the subject and tell you how you should pass some suggestions from me. My name is Francis Braganza. I've been teaching the subject for more than 20 years. So I hope to share my experience with you as I give you some ideas, some tips as to how to pass this paper. I must say it's a very easy paper to pass. Uh, the pass rates have been one of the highest amongst all the ACCA papers, but the syllabus is large, a vast syllabus. But in the midst of all that, there's a certain pathway you take to pass. And that's where I'm going to take you, show you that path through the syllabus. So, financial reporting. What is F7 all about, you ask? It's a second level accounting paper, so I might just highlight that word second. It's worse than the AAT, CAT, F3, that kind of thing. Now, the other day, one of my evening students said to me, I've done AAT, surely I know everything about F7. I had to take him aside and say, do be careful. Doing the AAT, or indeed CAT, is not the same as doing the ACCA. So even though you might have introduced, or had introduced to you, certain areas of the syllabus that seem similar to F7, you must acknowledge the fact that F7, of course, is a much higher level. So do be careful of that. It is second level financial accounting. It tests understanding and, of course, time management. The biggest reason why people fail this exam is because of poor time management. So you've got to be quite tight with your time. So I might highlight that as well. What else can we say? Uh, the, the other thing to remember, of course, is that you must be able to prepare to prepare financial statements, basically final accounts. Now what that is, uh, quite simply, those of you who have done some first level accounting, which is of course assumed at this level, but don't worry, as I take you through the F7 paper, I will guide you uh, through some bits that you feel you might have missed if you've been exempted from F3, because I teach that as well sometimes. The key point, of course, is if you've got a company, or indeed any business, mainly a company, that carries out certain transactions, buying and selling certain things, these are described in the language of accountancy as debits and credits. Now, these debits and credits are gathered together when they describe a particular kind of transaction, let's say rent paid or sales, anything like that. Items that are similar are gathered together, be they debits or credits, into what's known as a T ledger account. It's like a T ledger account. Debits on one side, credits on the other. Now, an account, why is it called an account? I could describe to you my journey into this recording studio this morning, but that would be an account of what happened to me. So similarly, everything that happens to the sales account is recorded in this particular account. It's simply a story of something. Now, these T accounts are then gathered together, once they've been added up, uh, into what's known as a trial balance. You try to make it balance. And you have lists of debits and credits, and the trial balance, usually in the exam, given to you by the examiner, balances. You're then given certain adjustments to the trial balance, and from those adjustments, and of course the original trial balance figures, you produce what's known as the income statement, the statement of financial position, also known as a balance sheet, and of course the statement of cash flow. So that's the essence of the exam. What else can I say? The, apart from doing a single company set of accounts, I say there you've got to add together sometimes figures uh, for a group of companies. In other words, if you have a parent company that has more than 50%, the majority of the shares of another company, that other company is known as a subsidiary. So you have a parent company and a subsidiary company. They've got their own sets of accounts, their own legal status. But once they're added together, you're doing what's known as group accounts. 
So that's the other big skill that you need to know. What else is F7 about? Obviously cash flows, I've mentioned that, one of the easiest topics of the syllabus. And then calculating and more importantly interpreting a set of performance ratios. So cash flows are important and these performance ratios are important as well. Let's write that a bit. Ratios. So that's what F7 is about. It's second level accounting. You might need to do single company accounts, you might need to do group accounts, prepare cash flow statements and do ratio analysis. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Right, the syllabus areas that we can speak about, the syllabus areas. Uh, the first area, of course, is the conceptual framework. Then you have the regulatory framework. What are the concepts that underpin financial accounting, indeed financial reporting at this level? Uh, preparation of financial statements, as I was explaining to you. Business combinations, which means groups of companies coming together. And, of course, analyzing and interpreting. Now, the biggest problem for us, the biggest challenge, is that the paper, especially in Part C, is based on international standards. And there are about 30 of these standards. So that's a big challenge for us as we run through uh, that particular area. What else can we say? The exam format itself. F7 is assessed by a 3R paper-based paper, uh, paper -based exam plus 15 minutes of reading time. Use those 15 minutes as you start, before you even start your three hours, as soon as you go into the exam hall, and once you've got past all your admin activities, the 15 minutes should be spent selecting your best question. I remember me, when I was a student years ago, uh, I looked at the paper, I found it quite difficult, the highest level of accounting that I did, but uh, there was one question I felt I could do very easily. Now, even though I felt I couldn't do some of the other areas, foreign currency and other things, the fact that I could do one of those questions, even though it was only a 10 mark question, it gave me such a boost of confidence that I was able to sail through that question in the, with a minimum of effort and, and encouraged by that, I was able to face the harder questions. So I'd always recommend doing your easiest questions first and that seems to spread, that confidence seems to spread into the other areas. So that's what I would suggest to you. Keep your confidence up. Do the easiest question first. Use your 15 minutes to make that decision at the start. Of course, you're allowed to write all over your question paper. So if you've got a group of companies, you may consider working out the percentage for the group structure, for example. You might consider using those 15 minutes to work out some of those adjustments that you get in group company accounts. So that's how I'd I would use my time. But on the during the main course, I'll explain to you how uh, to use your 15 minutes wisely. So, question one of the exam then is on consolidations, the coming together of a parent and a subsidiary, that kind of thing. Occasionally, you'll get something called an associate. So, remember, a parent is where you have more than 50% of a subsidiary, the majority of the shares. You, the parent might also have between 20 and 50% of another company called the associate. So it uh, participates in the associate's day-to-day -day operations, but it doesn't control it. But you can see there is a certain technique, as you'd imagine, of getting together a parent, a subsidiary, and an associate. That concept is examined in question one, consolidations. It includes a small discussion element, and computations are designed to test the understanding of principles. So I'd like you to underline that word understanding, because that really is what this exam is about. You have to demonstrate some understanding. Don't worry, I'll show you how all that works as the course unfolds. It's a very easy paper, remember that. Never forget that. Big syllabus, but the way to pass it, be good on consolidations. 
The second thing you've got to be good at is preparing or restating financial statements, also known as published accounts. Any large company who's uh, taken money from the public investing, the members of the public investing in this company, has a duty to, re to rep uh, report on its performance every 12 months. Now, that process is called, obviously, the um, preparation of final accounts, financial statements, the income statement, the statement of financial position, etc. So that's the subject of question two. Question three is on cash flows and or interpretation, performance appraisal interpretation. Question four and five are conceptual, regulatory framework type of questions, mainly the accounting standards. Now, questions often have three or four syllabus topics within them, so do be careful of that. On average, one would say 33 marks are available for discussion, for writing, and 67% for calculations. So, 33 marks are for writing. Actually, all the marks are for writing, but 33 marks out of the 100 are for words without numbers. So if you like writing, you must score well on those 33 marks. If you like numbers, you must score well on the 67 marks. When I was a student, I was exactly split between the ability to write and the ability to do numbers. Though in this paper, you will notice that it's twice as important to be good at numbers. But some people are so well developed in doing numbers that they completely ignore the need to write. And that is so sad because they try to get their 50 out of 67. Now, you and I know that 50 out of 67 is something like 75%. And that's quite a tall order, quite difficult to do in the space of those um, three hours you have and indeed the pressures you face in the exam and the size of syllabus. So I would suggest the better you are at the written bits, the easier it is going to be to pass. Uh, the, another thing to remember, of course, is when you're writing about something, the examiner will say to his team of markers, accept any reasonable point. But if you're doing a calculation, the examiner will say to his markers, accept this figure and this figure alone. Okay, if you get it half right, you get half the marks. But it isn't any thing like accept a reasonable figure. So what I'm saying to you is it's actually easier to get the 33 marks of written uh, material than it is to get the calculations because the yardstick, the measurement used for the numbers is very objective. It's either right or wrong. Maybe it's half right. But when it comes to the words, as long as the idea is correct, you will get the full marks. They tend to be quite lenient with the writing bits of the paper. And so the examiner tells us at these conferences, please be careful with uh, encouraging your students to do the writing. Uh, tell them not to ignore the writing and only do the numbers, because that is a dangerous way to approach F7, which is why the pass rates uh, in some centers fall, because people are reluctant to write. So, what else can I say about this wonderful paper?